and good evening. Welcome to Wednesday Night Connect. I'm trusting that you are staying connected in prayer, in the Word, and worshiping together with us every Sunday that we have church. Also, Friday Night Prayer Connect. We have a, a devotional done on Monday night, and we have, of course, Wednesday Night Connect, looking into the Word of God. Stay connected. Don't get disconnected. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. We got to stay together. We got to stay connected and stay connected to each other and stay connected to Jesus. So we have been talking about habits that hurt, things that can get a hold of our heart, things that can get a hold of our mind and get a hold of our lives and ruin relationships with each other, with our spouses, with our children and ruin our relationship with God. We've already talked about wrath. We've talked about sloth. We've talked about envy. Tonight, I want to talk about something that is often regarded as the source of all sins, and this is pride. What is pride? Pride is selfishness that puts one's desires ahead of all others' desires. Pride says, me first, what I want and what I need must come first. But it's also more than that. Pride can also be an excessive admiration of oneself. Someone who always admires themselves and looks in the mirror and admires what they see and looks at their accomplishments and looks at their career and looks at their house or their vehicle or their uh, uh, whatever they've done in their lives and said, look what I have done and I have done it without God. When somebody says that, I've done it all by myself, no one helped me, that person may be dealing with the habit that hurts that is called pride. Pride also goes further than that. It's irrational because it says, I am superior to everyone else. I am better than him. I am better than her. I am better than you. I don't need anyone. I am superior. This is the habit and the sin of pride. So, if you are dealing with pride, you might be saying, I'm God. Now, no one says that to themselves or to other people, but our actions, and all of us to a certain extent deal with this, basically imply that we are like a God. Pride is a belief that's so strong, not in others are not in God, but in oneself. This belief is so strong that it ignores the power of God, it ignores the grace of God, it ignores the mercy of God, and says, look at what I have done. I didn't need anyone. So there's two different ways that we can be full of pride. The first one is to be loud and obnoxious and brag. Look at my new this. Look what I've done. Look at my job. Look at my this and that. Look at my trophy husband. Look at my trophy wife. Look at how good my kids are. Look at how fancy my life is. Look how virtuous I am. Look how holy I am. That's one form of pride. But there's another more insidious form of pride. There's a more insidious form of pride that is not braggadocious. It does not brag. In fact, this second form of pride appears to be very humble. However, beneath the surface of this false humility is the idea that one thinks that he or she is better than everyone else. Better than everyone else and has no need to change. In fact, this form of pride says, you know, I'm just trying to do my best and it's everybody else who's wrong. Everybody else is doing the wrong thing and I am good and I am humble and I am living the right way and everybody else around me is not. 
And this is an insidious, terrible form of pride because it's hard to even recognize it. Because on the surface, it's true. The person might be saying, you know what, I am doing pretty good. Uh, and they might be doing better than other people. And yet, this form of pride looks down with disdain and anger, looks down at other people and says, these other people are no good. And the, the hidden message is, I'm better than them. And so this excessive view of oneself as better than others becomes a problem. It becomes a problem because this excessive view of one's own goodness becomes a way to cast shadow on everyone else. Pride is often called the sin from which all other sins come from. Pride is something that we often can't see in ourselves, but we recognize it immediately when we see it in someone else. And when we see it in someone else, it's so distasteful and we don't like it, but we can't often see it in ourselves. We rarely accuse ourselves of being full of pride. Often we will recognize that, you know what, I've got a problem with gluttony. We talked about gluttony. We might say, oh, I've got a problem with anger. I've got an anger problem. I, I, I'm always uh, losing my temper. And we might recognize that I have a problem with envy. Man, I'm so jealous and envious and I wish that I had what she had and I wish that, that uh, I, I had it so much that I, I wish she wouldn't even have it. We can recognize that and say, you know what, I've got a problem with envy, I've got a problem with anger, I've got a problem with uh, wrath, I've got a problem with gluttony. But I've never heard someone say, man, you know, I have a problem with pride. People just don't say that. This tells us how much of a hidden sin pride can be and how it can really hide itself in our life, so much so that we become deceived, so deceived as to not even recognize it in ourselves. We can see it in others, but we can't see it in ourselves. Pride is one thing that we have to let go of if we're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, because pride says, I'm in charge. And when pride is evident. It's really hard to let Jesus be in charge. Pride will not let God sit on the throne of your life. Someone once said that when you are on the throne of your life, Jesus is on the cross. But if Jesus is on the throne of your life, you are on the cross. And I think you would agree that Jesus ought to be on the throne of our lives and we ought to be on the cross. When Jesus is on the throne, we allow him to give us direction about what to do with our time. When Jesus is ruling our lives and we are on the cross, we give him uh, the authority in our lives to tell us what to do with our money and what to do with our talents and what to do with our marriage and how to uh, operate within our employment in our jobs when jesus is on the throne of your life amen everything is done in accordance to his will did not jesus pray as he made preparations to go to the cross not my will be done but thy will be done Someone who is full of pride has it backwards. They will say, not thy will be done, but my will be done. They got it backwards and they are sitting on the throne of their lives, directing their lives without any care or concern for what God wants them to do. But the funny thing is, they have a false God in their mind that is giving them permission to be self-willed and full of pride. So a good question about pride is, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a beggar with a little bit of bread going to the Father for more bread and trying to bring other people with you 
to get bread and really seeing all of humanity as a bunch of spiritually hungry people that need God, a member of which you are. I'm just a member of humanity trying to find God. Or do you see yourself as superior to the other people around you? Do you see yourself as better than others and more virtuous and more holy than other people? If so, you may be dealing with the hidden sin, the self-deceptive habit of pride, and it will hurt you and will hurt your relationships with the ones that you love, and it will hurt your relationship with God. Pride says, I'm so good, I deserve it. Pride says, I am a person who is so virtuous, I deserve good things. But that's not a biblical view. A biblical view is that anything that we get good, we didn't deserve it. God gave it to us. We must acknowledge Him in all of our ways and say, I didn't earn this. I didn't deserve it. God gave it to me. This is a way to combat that prideful attitude that says, I'm so good. Well, really, the Bible says none are good. There's none perfect. No, not one. Really, it's by the mercies of God that we are not consumed. It's by the blessings and the mercies of God that we have any good things in our lives. And that needs to always be at the forefront of our minds to avoid the hurtful habit of pride. Pride says, I can't believe that that family member did that to me. I can't believe that she would say that to me. Pride says, I can't believe because I am a good person and I am better. Pride is so deceptive. You see, if you were to rob a bank, now I hope that you would never rob a bank. I'm trusting that you would not do that. But if you were to rob a bank, it's pretty obvious that now that individual who's robbed a bank is now a thief. It's very obvious. Something has been stolen that did not belong to that person. And that person is now a thief. But how do we know if we are a person full of pride? How do we know if we are a proud person? It's pretty easy to tell if you are a person full of anger, if you're punching holes through the doors and kicking in the drywall and shouting and yelling and screaming it all the time, you might be a person who's dealing with the habit of anger. If you are a person, it's pretty obvious if you're a person who deals with gluttony, it's not hard to tell if you're eating till you puke every single meal and you just can't stop eating and you're eating your emotions, you might be able to figure out, hey, you know what, I think I'm dealing with gluttony. If you're a person who lays around all day and expects everybody else to do your work, you might be a person dealing with the habit of sloth. But how do I know if I'm a person that is dealing with the hurtful habit, the sin of pride? Well, like many of the habits of sin, we go back to the Garden of Eden. This is the origin story for sin. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit that they were not supposed to eat, it was because one of the reasons that they ate that fruit was not just gluttony, but it was also because of pride. Remember that they, Eve was told, if you eat this fruit, you will become He's so wise and you will know the difference between good and evil and you'll be like a god. You will be so smart. It was an appeal to her pride. It was an appeal to her sense of ego and saying, you know what, if you eat this fruit, you're going to be a big deal. Anytime we are worried about being a big deal, we might be dealing with pride. 1 John 2.15 says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The pride of life is not 
of the Father. We've got to be careful because if we have the pride of life, then we are not of the Father. Pride is an insidious, habitual sin that we need to combat if we're going to be of the Father. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride cometh before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. It is so easy to be lifted up in pride because of a few accomplishments or because you're able to get a few uh, things dealt with in your life and kind of put some things together and God shows mercy and God delivers and then pride can rise up. Well, that pride will take you to destruction. We have to deal with it. Galatians 6.3 talks about the deception that comes along with pride. It says, For if any man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We can be so self-deceived into thinking that we are something that we are not. It's bad enough we've got social media that can tempt us to promote push forth an image of something that we are not, but we can actually tell ourselves that we are something that we are not. And even as I'm saying this right now, you might be saying, hey, I don't have any pride. I'm not a proud for person. I don't boast. I don't brag. I don't list my accomplishments. Right there, this is an example of the self-deception that we can have. We start lying to ourselves and saying, well, I don't have any pride. That statement alone is a statement of pride. <laughs> Think about it. So let's deal with it. Let's see if we can eradicate it. Let's see if we can combat it because it is in the heart of every human being. The sin, the hurtful habit of pride. We talked about how pride creates other sins. Pride creates uh, sloth. It says, you know, I don't have to do anything. I don't uh, deserve to have to work. I, I can do my own thing. Pride also creates lust. Lust says, my pleasure comes first before any plan that God has for my life. Pride creates anger. Anger says, if I don't get my way, then somebody's going to have to pay. Have you ever thought like that? If you're human, maybe you have. If I don't get my way, somebody's going to have to pay. This is anger. And anger is a sin that descends from pride. Pride convinces us to become greedy. Greed says... I want it so bad, I want to take it away from someone else, and I want it more and more because I'm good and I'm better. Pride can convince us to partake in the sin of envy. I deserve what she has because I'm better, and she doesn't deserve to have it. This is the sin, the habitual habit of pride. There was once a story told of a, of a man and he was a owner of a huge company and he, he was very wealthy. And this man was driving with his wife and they went to go get a quick bite to eat at McDonald's. And as they pulled into the drive through and they talked on the speaker and the microphone and ordered their food and they pulled in uh, to the window and the woman recognized the man in the drive through window. It was a man that she used to date in high school. And, and she recognized him and he recognized her. And they talked briefly before the food came out. And they said their goodbyes and got their hamburgers. And they went on their way. And the man said, so that's someone that you used to date. I bet you're glad that you married me, the owner of a big company. I'm, I bet you're so glad that you, you know, got connected with me and you're not married to some guy uh, working at McDonald's who doesn't have a profitable career like I do. And she answered back without skipping a beat, if I would have married him, then he would have been the owner of a profitable company and he would have been rich and you would have been the one working at the McDonald's drive-thru. 
Do you see the pride that the man had in that example? The pride of this man was that it was all him that created his success. He didn't acknowledge that he had a faithful wife. He didn't acknowledge the fact that maybe his wife's contributions and her sacrifices contributed to his success. He said all of his success was because of him and that he could have made it without her. Well, that isn't always true, is it? We need other people. Pride says, I can do it alone. Pride says, I don't need anybody. Pride says, I've accomplished it without the help of anyone else. This is a lie that we tell ourselves. Don't you know that no man is an island? That everybody is connected to somebody else? If you have any success at all in your life, if you have anything that you've accomplished, there's probably someone in your past, whether it was your parents or your relatives or your grandparents, that have helped you and brought you up and taught you and they showed you how to get up in the morning and go to work and they showed you how to love and they showed you how to pray and they modeled to you what it meant to go to church and worship Jesus together in community with other people. And besides all that, there is a God that reigns in the heavens and the earth. And to him we owe our success. And to him we owe a, a debt of gratitude for our very life that is in our body. Never mind any successful endeavors that we are able to accomplish. The glory belongs to God. But when you take the glory to yourself, you become filled with this habitual sin of pride. This is why I don't even like people saying, saying, that's Pastor Obi Fromm's church. I don't have a church. The church belongs to God. It's God's church. Jesus died for the church. He bought it with blood. It's not my church. It's Jesus's church. As soon as I start saying it's my church, I'm concerned that I will be lifted up with pride. I don't want to say that. I don't want to think that way. It's not my church. I don't own a church. And we got to think about that same mentality for almost every area of our lives. It's not my house. God gave me this house. It's not my car. God gave me this car. It's not my kids. God gave me these kids to raise and grow and nurture, but they don't belong to me, especially when they get to be adults. You'll realize that those kids don't belong to you. They are God's kids. Everything in our life has been given to us. Your money. You think your money is your money? It's not your money. That's God's money. God said, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. He says, I own it all. I own everything. You can't say it's yours. God just gives it to you to be a steward of it, to be someone who's a caretaker of it. Your life is not even your own. The Bible says, don't you know you were bought with a price? that you are not your own, that you are bought, amen, with a price, and the price was blood. Your life was just given to you to be a steward of it. And what will you do with your life? Pride says, it's my life. Pride says, it's my money, my house, my car, my career, and I have earned it all. That's a lie. We didn't earn anything. Any good thing we get, God gave to us. Pride is also associated with the sin of gossip. Gossip is when we sit around and complain about the negative aspects of other people's lives. Why would we do that? Well, sometimes the reason people gossip is because they feel very inferior and they feel insufficient. So in order to make themselves feel a little bit higher, they will gossip about others and push others down lower and see I'm better than her and I'm better than him. And as they begin to gossip and complain about other people, someone who is always gossiping and talking bad about other people may be dealing with the hurtful habit of pride. Well, they are messed up more than me, so I must be doing pretty good. 
and then to broadcast that to everybody you see, it is a sin and it's called pride. This is another reason why many people enjoy disparaging politicians. You will always find a politician who's messed up. You will always find a politician who's made a mistake. And when we love to share that mistake and talk about how bad they are and how horrible they are, it makes us feel just a little bit better because now I'm better than that politician. I am more virtuous than that per politician. I'm more virtuous than Justin Trudeau or Stephen Harper or Brian Mulroney or Ronald Reagan or Donald Trump or Obama or Biden. I don't care what name you put in there. The Bible says to pray for those that are in political positions. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says we should disparage those people that have been placed in powerful positions, but that we should pray for them. Paul said, pray for the emperor. But when we are constantly slamming them and talking about how bad they are, we might be dealing with the habitual sin of pride and not knowing that it actually hurts people around us and it hurts us. How does it hurt us? Well, it's called the grave digger effect. The more that we constantly slam other people and criticize other people and whisper about other people how awful they are and you never, you'll never guess what she did and she's not very good and he's a horrible person and he's uh, bad at this and he's and never once say anything positive about anybody, thinking that you're elevating yourself. The more you criticize people and slam people and and say how bad other people are. There's something called the grave digger effect that psychology tells us that negativity, instead of projecting it, you become it. You become what you're always talking about. And this dark prison uh, begins to be a struct constructed around your life, a prison that you constructed from your own negative talk and your own criticizing, backstabbing, disparaging, looking down at other people, and you create a prison around yourself. And people that don't think that way, and people that want to be positive, and people that want to progress, and people that want to try, they begin to distance themselves from you. And you find yourself alone in a prison of your own construction because you focus so much on the negative, you became negative. And this pride will cause you to become so puffed up, you'll become so delusional. You will say, I don't even need God. I don't even need the word of God. It's a waste of time. I don't even need to pray. I don't even need to go to church. I'm better than that church. I'm better than God. I'm better than prayer. And this pride puffs your self-opinion so delusionally big that you become a God unto yourself and you submit to no man, no God, no word, and you become a self-made God. The Bible says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Everybody ought to have someone in their lives that can pull them aside and say, hey, you know what? I think you made a mistake. Everybody needs someone in their lives to be a correcting influence. Everyone needs that. But when you push all correction aside and say, I don't need anything, I'll make my own decision, I'm self-made, you might be dealing with the habitual sin of pride. And we live in a society where we can have all of our needs taken care of. We don't have to struggle too hard to find food. I'm sure that today you were able to find something to eat without too much of a battle. We don't have to struggle too hard to get shelter over our, house, over our head. You can, everyone can get an apartment or a house or some sort of a shelter to stay in. And then when you get a good job and you've got good money coming in, sometimes that can blind you and you can be, begin to think, you know what, I'm doing pretty good. And I'm doing pretty good because of me. And then we can get these invisible tentacles 
of pride that begin to wrap themselves around our heart and we begin to lose empathy for other people that are struggling and we begin to look down on them and say you know what the reason she is struggling is because it's her own fault she just didn't work as hard as I did, not realizing that it wasn't because of your hard work alone. It was because you were given opportunities that other people were not given and because God has blessed you. And somebody else who's struggling, we look at them and say, oh, well, you know, I'm just better than them. And so when pride gets a hold of you, instead of being a person who has empathy and a person who is patient and loving towards other people, we become selfish instead of becoming selfless. And we don't want to help people and we don't want to extend mercy and grace to people. We only extend judgment and we only extend a, a perspective that says, I am better and you are lower than me. Pride becomes a twisting and a distortion of the good things that God has provided in your life because those good things are used to give glory to the self instead of giving glory to God. Now, I want to qualify what I'm saying here. I'm, I'm saying that it doesn't mean that we should never go after excellence and we should never go after successful things with a passion. But what I'm saying is this desire to succeed can become a destructive agent in your life if the glory is not given to God and we begin to look down at other people that have not achieved the same success. Pride can be born in your life when you begin to act like a God. And what does it mean to act like a God? Well, here's a really good indication that you might be dealing with pride when you are always looking down at everybody else that means that there's nothing up above you to look up to when you are always pointing down to other people that means you are not looking up towards God and so we have to ask ourselves a question am I always judging other people do I find myself looking down at other people all the time? Do I find myself gossiping and complaining about other people's shortcomings? If so, it's time to repent of the habitual sin and hurtful habit called pride. If I look at others with a sense of superiority and I'm better and I'm bigger and I'm the best, we might be dealing with the sin of pride pride. In Luke 18, Jesus tells a story about a man who had a problem with pride. It says, he spoke this parable unto people who despised others. They trusted in themselves and they viewed themselves as righteous. So this is a little parable, a little story that he told the people that were full of pride, who despised other people and saw themselves as better. He said, two men went to go pray, a publican. And the Pharisee said this, I thank God that I'm not as bad as that publican. He said, I thank God that I'm not unjust. I thank God that I'm not an adulterer. I thank God that I'm not a thief. I thank God that I'm the one who's the, uh, got it together and I'm not as bad as him. And the publican smote his chest with his fist and said, Have mercy on me, God. I'm a sinner. You see, the Pharisee was full of the sin of pride. Although he was doing well in a lot of areas of his life, and he had his life together in some ways, and, and he was not committing a lot of certain of sins, there was one hidden sin that he was blind to, and that was his pride. He had a pride in self-righteousness, and it was so bad that he was thanking God in pride. We can be so prideful that we are thankful that we're not as bad as someone else who is doing worse than us, and pretend that we are thanking God for our self elevated view of ourselves. He said, I fast twice a week. 
He said, I give tithes of all that I possess. He begins listing all the ways that he is better than other sinners and better than other people. And it was likely true. He was doing things that are good to do. He paid his tithes. He fasted. He prayed. He was doing a lot of good things. But his good had turned to evil because he used it as a way to exalt himself above other people. And I would even go so far as to argue that he exalted himself above God because he said, it is I that do these things. I fast. I pay tithes of all that I own. I, I, I. He never once said, because of God's mercy in my life, I have some things in my life that are going well. He never once acknowledged God. He made himself God. And this is a telltale sign of pride in our lives when we exalt ourselves. We read, Everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself shall be exalted. I think we it should go without saying that we ought to humble ourselves before God, humble ourselves before our brothers and our sisters, humble ourselves before our spouses and our families and even your kids. Humble yourselves in, in relationships and you'll see that relationships can be restored when you come into that relationship with a humble attitude. But when you come into that relationship with pride, exalting yourself, it destroys the relationship. People don't like being around someone who exalts themselves all the time and looks down on everybody else and is bitter towards everybody else. I don't even like being around gossips. It appeals to the flesh to hear the, the latest gossip and how bad somebody is doing. And, and uh, it's, it's kind of appealing to the carnal human nature. But after a while, you just get sick of that constant bitter backstabbing. And you begin to wonder, if she's willing to gossip about so-and-so, I wonder if she's willing to gossip about me. If he's willing to slam so-and-so, I wonder how much that he gossips about me. And so you begin to withdraw yourself from people that are full of caustic, toxic gossip. You begin to withdraw yourself from people that are full of pride because it's not enjoyable to be around them. All they care about is their own feelings. All they care about is their own deal. They never once acknowledge somebody else with empathy. They never once say, you know what? I want to pray for you. They're always saying, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Well, when will you pray for someone else? Pride says, me first. A humble, contrite spirit says, you know what? It's not all about me. How can I pray for you? This pride also creates a lot of anxiety. And I think this is one of the reasons that our society right now is so full of anxiety. And that is because pride says, it's all my responsibility. It's all up to me. You've probably heard that expression. If it's to be, it's up to me. And I understand the the, uh, the theory behind it, you know, you got to do something with your life and you got to take the bull by the horns and try to do something. But we got to be careful with that because if it's to be, it's not all up to me. If it's to be, it's up to God. In Acts 2, the Bible says that God added day to the church. It doesn't say that Peter added to the church. It said God added to the church. So we have to acknowledge that it's not all our technical skills and abilities that accomplishes things in our lives. It is God that accomplishes things in our lives. And so we can become quite anxious. We can be quite, become quite stressed because we think we have all this responsibility to take care of our sins, to take care of our habits and our hurts and our hang-ups. And we're going through... Uh, uh, the, and we are going through an addictions program, recovery from trauma and addictions. And one of the important ideas in that program is that it's not in under all under my control. 
God is the one that's in control of my life. And if I'm going to get freedom, it's not going to come from my actions alone. It's going to come from acknowledging that I need help. It can be a heavy burden trying to play God. Pride is a comparative sin. It's always comparing to other people. Pride says, I'm better than her. But pride also says, there's people better than me. And now I have to work hard at trying to be better than them. And so pride is always comparing, comparing your life to someone else's life. This is why people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on plastic surgery. They're too busy comparing their appearance to someone else's appearance. This is why people spend so much money on expensive things things in their lives because they're trying to be impressive. They're trying to be big and bold and the best. But these things come at a high price because there's always going to be someone who is bigger than you. There's always going to be someone who's richer than you. There's always going to be someone who drives a newer car than you. And the more you compare with other people, the more pride is agitated and it causes us to be anxious and angry. And so what do we do? We go get another credit card and go get more debt, go borrow more money to try and satisfy an unsatisfying empty pit of pride. Pride also says, I have secret knowledge that no one else has. Pride says, I know all about the conspiracies. These can be all potential manifestations of pride. And if you are offended right now that I just said that, I pray that you would be delivered because we no one knows it all. No one has all knowledge about all these terrible things things going on in our world. But pride says, no, I know it all. A humble contrite spirit says, what can I learn? Pride says, let me tell you all about it. I watched a YouTube video all about it and I will tell you, I will teach you everything. I know more than the doctors. I know more than the epidemiologists. I know more than everybody because pride says, I know it all. I'm God. I don't care if it's politics. I don't care if it's left or right. I don't care if it's vaccines or face masks. Opinions are like belly buttons. Everybody's got one. And when you're full of pride, you figure your opinion is the only opinion that matters. It doesn't matter if you are pro or against. It doesn't matter if you're for it or against it. If you have pride, you are unwilling to even listen to anybody else. And all you do is spout off with a prideful attitude what you think to be the truth. Even somebody who has the truth, even somebody who knows the truth, that person would not be prideful. That person would not be aggressive. Some people that actually know things, people who are actually intelligent, they're some of the most humble people because they know that they don't know it all. And they take their words and their steps very carefully. And they're very cautious about the things that they say. And they don't claim to, to know it all because no one knows it all, because no one's God. Anytime somebody acts like they know it all, you know that they may be dealing with the sinful, hurtful habit of pride. I'm not saying you gotta think of yourself as a nobody that knows nothing. I'm not saying you should think less of yourself, but I am saying that you should think of yourself a little bit less and be willing to listen and be willing to empathize and be willing to pray for people. Here's a question. How much time do you spend looking down on others and complaining about others? And how much time do you spend in prayer and fasting for those people? That's quite a different balance, isn't it? How much time do you spend complaining about other people? How much time do you spend uh, uh, frustrated and, and yelling at people and angry with people and complaining and gossiping about people? And how much time do you spend praying 
for those people? How much time do you spend trying to understand those people and listening to those people and trying to help? You see, pride is always busy of tipping the scale, trying to always make oneself feel better by blasting and complaining and gossiping about other people. So if you want to defeat pride, if you're really serious about getting victory over this pride problem, it's time to reach out and empathize and pray and fast and help other people. In Matthew 21, we read a very interesting statement. We read that prostitutes are going to get into the kingdom before the righteous. You see, when you see yourself as righteous and better than the prostitutes, you are not of the kingdom. There is none perfect. No, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't. doesn't matter if you didn't rob a bank last week. doesn't matter if you didn't uh, cheat on your spouse. It doesn't matter if you are doing all these good things like the Pharisee was. What matters is our attitude and how much pride we've allowed to control our perspective. Okay, here's some hard-hitting statements. Pride says, I can walk with God without a prayer life. Pride says, I can be a follower of Jesus and never read my Bible. Pride says, I can be a worshiper but never worship with the worshipers. Pride says, I've got it all figured out. I don't need to do anything. Pride says, I'm going to evaluate other people. Pride says, I'm going to get out the scorecard and I'm going to make a judgment about other people's lives and other people's abilities and other people's walks with God and other people's parenting and other people's kids. This is pride. I'm going to go so far to say as it's very hard for anyone to be saved who is full of pride. Because pride doesn't allow Jesus to be on the throne of our lives. Pride creates a false Jesus that approves of our pride. I thank God that I'm not like this sinner. I thank God that I'm not an extortioner. I thank God that I'm not an adulterer. I thank God that I'm not a thief. I thank God that I'm so good. It's a false God that people create when they are full of pride. And if we're honest, we create that false God. I create that false God in my life when I begin to exalt myself and look down on other people. And so I think the enemy is pleased when we have victory over drug abuse and we have victory over alcohol. And we finally defeated that anger problem and we finally defeated our greed but we have pride about our self-righteousness. Look how good I am. It's like the enemy has said, it's okay, we'll allow you to get over that cold, but we'll give you cancer. We'll allow you to get over anger, but we'll give you pride about how good you are at controlling your anger. We'll allow you to get over envy and laziness. We'll get, allow you to get over that habit that you have of always eating too much but as long as you have pride about it and you look down your nose at people that are eating donuts at work and say see I don't eat donuts I'm better than them then you've got over the cold but now you have the cancer called pride I want to give you an interesting statement I don't care what other people think of me it sounds good, right? I will do what's right and I don't care what anybody says. And on the surface, it seems like a good statement. You know, we ought to, someone wants to get baptized. They shouldn't really care if somebody doesn't want them to get baptized. If somebody wants to receive the Holy Ghost and they want to go to church each Sunday and sing and worship with the people of God, they shouldn't care if somebody else doesn't like that. But that statement can also be taken a little bit too far. We got to be careful with that. To a point, yes, we shouldn't care what other people think about us. But when we get to the point where we don't care what anybody says or thinks, we can be stepping into pride. Because we can be so prideful that we could say, other people aren't worth caring about. I am the only one 
I'm the only one that matters. My opinion is the only opinion that matters. And there, we might be stepping into pride. So we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful with that. There was a man who was once sitting in a restaurant. He was a famous basketball player and he had a lot of money. And he was sitting at his table and he asked for butter. And the waiter said, yeah, just a minute, I'll bring the butter. But he never brought the butter. And this famous basketball player's potatoes were getting cold. And he said it again, I need the butter. And yeah, 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 just wait, I'll bring the butter. And this happened three or four times. And finally, the basketball player, this famous rich basketball player, got up from the table and stomped over to the waiter and said, Do you know who I am? I am rich and I am famous. And why is it that you won't even help me? And the waiter said, Well, I didn't know you were rich or famous. But do you know who I am? I'm the man in charge of the butter. So sometimes we can get an elevated view of ourselves and ignore other people and ignore other people in our lives because we're so consumed with our own needs and so consumed with our own self-identity that we ignore and look down upon other people. So how do we combat pride? First of all, we need to identify it. You need to be brutally honest with ourselves. As I was studying for this, I had to be brutally honest with myself. What areas of my life do I have pride? Would you be willing to be brutally honest with yourself? What areas of your life are you dealing with pride? Where do you look down on other people? We have to also understand the lies that we believe. Here's a lie that you can believe if you're full of pride. The world is against me. The only reason that it's not working out is because the world is against me. This is an expression of pride. Pride says I must do better and bigger and I must do it by myself. I've got to increase. Pride says my top priority is to increase my bank account, increase the square footage of my house, increase my the year of my vehicle, increase the nice clothes hanging in my closet. Pride says bigger, 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 increase, increase, increase. But that's not what John the Baptist said. John the Baptist says, I must decrease and he must increase. I'm not saying it's a horrible, terrible thing to live in a nice house. I'm not saying it's a horrible thing to have decent clothes and a vehicle that runs nicely and works good and looks good. I'm not saying that's a sin. But when all we care about is increasing ourselves and all we care about is increasing our image and increasing how good we are and how better we are, I think we're missing out because John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that Jesus can increase. Everything that John the Baptist was about was about increasing Jesus. Are we about increasing Jesus? Or are we about increasing ourselves? Are we about promoting Jesus to others? Or are we about promoting how good we are and how horrible others are? Well, I hope that after tonight's Bible study that you have a little bit of a perspective change on the hidden pride that can infect every one of us. I pray that God would reveal our hidden pride, the hidden tentacles of pride that wrap themselves around our hearts as we look down on other people and that you can combat it with me, that we can combat this pride by talking to people that we sometimes look down on and reaching out to people to people that we think that we're better than them and listening to people and listening to other people's ideas instead of pushing through our own ideas. This is how we can recover ourselves from the attitude of that Pharisee who said, I thank God that I'm better than everybody else and realize with honesty that we're not better than everyone else. We're just human. We're just souls encased and robed in flesh, just like everybody else. Level ground at the foot of the cross. And Jesus is the only one lifted up, high and lifted up. And he's the one we ought to exalt. He's the one that we ought to have a divine wonderment 
and a divine gratitude for the good things in our life toward and say you know what it's because of God and it says acknowledge him in all of your ways well God bless you I am glad that you could join tonight we'll see you on the prayer line we're praying for families this Friday on the prayer call and we'll see you on Sunday we are continuing through the book of Revelation God bless you have a great night and we will continue to connect with you stay connected because someone who says I don't need to be connected might be dealing with pride God help us we need each other I need you we need to need each other and we need God have a great night